Yeah. Okay. All right. So yes, just sir. to say, I'm, I, as I said, I'm not an immunologist. I'm coming from this uh, from a, a practical uh, point of view of a, of, of, of a clinician. And um, the, the interesting thing about immunolo- immunotherapy or biological therapy is that it's the treatment of disease by activating or suppressing the immune system. And I think the first thing I'd like to say is that <clears throat> one of the big themes that I took from this meeting uh, the ISPAD meeting, is that in this area, it may well be other forms of treatment and suppression that we should be thinking about. In other words, we're all focusing on suppression of the immune system, but there may well be other other areas in the in quite immediate future which you'll be thinking about. And I will explain explain that as we as we go along. <laughs> The other thing I took about is was a revisitation in the meeting of perhaps a more simpler view of what's going on in terms of the cause of type 1 diabetes. Um, and I'll go through this slide in a second because it's quite, quite complicated. But it's less complicated than many of the other slides that we see around the immunology of type 1 diabetes. Um, and I'm sure you've all seen those pictures with the, the various uh, monoclonal antibody sites, or the sites in the, in, the, in, the, in the pathway where various monoclonal antibodies can, can act in, in, um, against the immune response. And in a sense, what was proposed at the meeting, and I felt in two or three sessions that I attended, this gained more credence, was the um, concept which was put forward way back in the 1980s by a Professor Franco Batazzo is that is type 1 diabetes related to the murder of the beta cell or the suicide of the beta cell and, and what that basically says is that is there something inherently wrong with the beta cell which then sets up the whole process, in other words, suicide, rather than always thinking about that the beta cells are fantastically healthy uh, and yet are being attacked uh, from the outside by all sorts of uh, aspects, uh, and that is murder. And I think the, the concept of the beta cell suicide gained a lot of traction throughout the meeting. So what does this mean? And it raised the, the, the issue very strongly in my mind of the whole business of beta cell stress, which is number one in this diagram. And one thing that uh, the ISPAD meeting really opened up to my eyes is that I hadn't quite registered before is that the beta cell in the pancreas is one of the most metabolically active cells in the body. And therefore, it, in a sense, I mean, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard not to think of this in mechanistic terms, but you, you can't really think of it in mechanistic terms. But any stress on that, on that cell, any damage to the mechanisms within that cell is reflected in, in a poor function. And so if you get an increased metabolic demand of the beta cell, and that might be caused by all sorts of things. We don't know what that triggering event is. It may be nutrients, it may be chemicals, uh, it may be viruses, um, but there obviously does seem to have been in the last 40, 50 years, something external to the beta cell, which has produced that drive because we've seen underlying the rise in type two diabetes, we've seen the underlying rise in, in so-called type 1 diabetes. So you've got an increased metabolic demand, and that results in endoplasmic reticulum and oxidative stress, and the beta cell gets ill, gets wobbly, gets poor function. And because of that, internal chemicals start to leak out of the cell. You get chemokine released by the beta cell, that's number two. Then number three, that sets up the attraction of the immune cells, such as the macrophages and the T cells, and induces the autoantibody production. 
And then you get islet damage from those, the insulinitis, which, which develops, and you get the T cell interactions, the antibody release uh, directly through the release of the inflammatory cytokines, reactive oxygen speed, and then you get further endoplasmic and oxidative stress. And you can then see with the islet cell damage that you've got this cycle of, of uh, stress, damage, response from the, from the body, which unfortunately produces more damage and you go into a viral uh, a spin. At the same time, it sends off the apoptosis pathways in number five, and you get inability to restore this homeostasis, and that's what leads to cell death. Now, I think that's a much simpler model to think about, but it's also, I think, probably the correct model. I think we've been, and this is one thing I took away from the meeting strongly, was that uh, we've been lulled into a view that everything is driven by the antibodies. The antibodies that are produced in the diabetes are in response to the damage. They're actually the body trying to repair the situation to a degree. They're trying to stop the attack by the T cells and the macrophages. But obviously you then get into a flat spin and you get into this cycle of death and destruction. Uh, so it's, it's uh, to me, a much more simple model, and I favour very much from this meeting the concept that it's beta cell suicide. So move on to the next one. So this, this, this sort of picture came up several times from, from everybody, the, the, the disease progression of type 1, which we're all beginning to now use quite, um, quite frequently, the, 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 the stages, so you've got pre-stage 1, stage one uh, stage one itself stage two stage three so in pre-stage one you <clears throat> you have the presence of antibodies and you probably have beta cell loss but that's very difficult to measure certainly in uh, human subjects um, and one of the messages i took from uh, the ispad meeting was uh, in one of the presentations was that uh, <clears throat> In, and I'll come on to this in a, in a minute, in different types of type 1 diabetes, maybe a lot of people still have quite a lot of functioning beta cell mass present. The problem is that the function is not very, very, very good. So there is this concept between beta cell mass and beta cell function. So when you talk about loss, is it mass or is it function? And it's difficult to work that out sometimes. You might get some so-called uh, disc, disc lidemia, but not really in pre-stage one. This is all, all normal uh, um, um, uh, uh, physiology. And then we'll come back to this, that this is a variable uh, genetic uh, environmental risk for type 1 diabetes. So here we are. These are the, the people who are going to get diabetes, but are perfectly well. They then shift into, uh, into stage one and they have antibodies. They may have some beta cell loss, but as I say, it's difficult to work out that exact uh, uh, amount. They haven't got dysglycemia, so their blood glucose control is normal and they're sim asymptomatic. Stage two then gets into the hyperglycemic phase. So these are the uh, the, the children, the ad young adults, the adolescents, the adults who <clears throat> have uh, slightly raised fasting blood glucoses, have a high postprandial blood glucose, uh, and will have a, an elevated glycosylated hemoglobin. They will have antibodies, and they will um, uh, uh, probably be losing beta cell mass quite regularly, that, and you can begin to get a feel for that with things like measurement of the C, C peptide. But again, they're asymptomatic. And then at this point here, they are diagnosed as diabetes. And they've obviously had developing diabetes at this point, but the clinical symptoms that we all recognize, the classical clinical symptoms start to come in and uh, you've got uh, persistent hyperglycemia. So that's the simplified version of the progression that we've got. It then gets a little bit more complicated, and I'm actually going to um, uh, probably miss over this one, but go on to this stage uh, here and really look at where 
and this was uh, a, a really uh, a topic which was really discussed in detail about the the risk benefit of immune therapy uh, in intervention. So here we have the risk benefit in this completely normal stage, pre-1 stage. Remember, we haven't got any antibodies. You've got first degree relative risk. So this may be something that uh, relatives are interested in. You've got varying progression and you've got to consider that this is particularly aimed. It's not exclusive, but is extended at, at young children because uh, it, it, if there's a gap between developing diabetes and the risk session, then it's got to be aimed at the very young. And you've got to consider whether there are any actual risk for measuring any of the biomarkers. Are they, are they good enough? And I'll come back to this in a second. Once you get onto this phase, stage one and stage two, if you like a pre-symptomatic type one diabetes, this is where these two stages here are where most of the work on the immunotherapy has been, has been, been done. And you've got positive antibodies, you've got progression rates, which people are beginning to understand. You've got developing dysglycemia uh, and uh, you've got a, a desire to uh, prevent the, the loss of the, the, the beta cell destruction or re, re stimulate the production of insulin or re stimulate the uh, islet, islet cell uh, morphology. Uh, and uh, we'll come on to this in a, in a second in more detail. Uh, and then finally, you've got this point here where you've got the diagnosis. And again, people have uh, tried to. Um, uh, Oops, sorry, tried to um, use various immunotherapy at that, that point um, and various therapies at that point, um, but with, with, without success at the present, present time. So what sort of therapies can we use? There's lots of different sorts of things. I think we're fixated on the concept of monoclonal antibodies at the present time, but there are all sorts of uh, uh, studies being going on in a whole variety of, of uh, Im immunotherapy. But I would point out that, that this may not be the, the exclusive track that you should go down. In fact, I think very strongly that came out of a very good workshop discussion in the meeting is that this is not the case at all. We're going to have to look probably at combination therapy uh, and not just of um, preventing the immune reaction the secondary immune reaction, but actually trying to think about how you can reduce the beta cell stress, the metabolic and ER stress, which is developing. So there's a lot of work going to come out on that over the next few, few years. Um, just as a, po a point on this, the, the example of what's going on in the cancer world uh, was, was raised in, in the sense that we could learn a lot from the way that the cancer people have developed their immune therapy programs um, and uh, uh, the way that they've used combination therapy and other sorts of therapy to go, go along with direct immune therapy. So to finish with, uh, we talked about the clinical prevention trials. And if you like, what you're trying to do is identify this person this person's got the disease, but in this person uh, and the, the blues, possibly, they're going to go on to get diabetes eventually. And so there's an enormous individual variation between who is designated to get diabetes and the speed with which they then go on to get diabetes. And one of the major themes that was discussed in the meeting was the heterogeneity of type 1 diabetes and the fact that we now have a whole series of endotypes of diabetes. And I think that any clinical prevention trial has to take this on board now. So we're beginning to see that some people, the two-year-old or three-year-old with diabetes, is probably metabolically and immunologically very different in terms of their beta cell functioning uh, to the 15-year-old who gets diabetes and certainly to the 25 and 35-year-old that gets diabetes.
What are we trying to achieve in these prevention trials? Well, that's also a good question. Is it that we're trying to look for complete cure? Probably that's what the patients want, obviously, but is it possible? Probably not. So what we're more interested in is looking at the rate of progression to clinical onset uh, in prevention and actually maintaining some of the beta cell function or beta cell mass uh, after the after the um, uh, the therapy. So that's also again uh, quite in, important. The, these are the, the clinical trials which have gone to stage three. And since the Abu Dhabi meeting finished, uh, and in fact this week, there was uh, an acceptance from um, NIH in America uh, that the uh, teplumzumab anti-CD3 monoclonal uh, has been released uh, for clinical use. It's been in uh, um, uh, clinical development research for the last oh, 10 years, I think. Uh, but, and there was a bit of a hold on it last year after the stage three trial, but they looked at the evidence and they um, uh, have accepted that uh, this can be used as uh, the first vehicle for uh, prevention of diabetes. But I just want to say that no study has confirmed complete long-term reduction in clinical diabetes. And neither has had teplumzumab. So they've only looked up to two years. They've not looked beyond up to five or 10 years. And that's going to be interesting to see what those follow-up studies uh, are, are going to uh, suggest. I'm just going to finish with one major point, which was... If you like, I think avoided at ISPAD. It was like the elephant in, in the room, which nobody wanted to talk about. The vast majority of around the world are picking up people with diabetes at diagnosis. And the vast majority of, of uh, health services in the world are not thinking about de early detection of pre-diabetes and I think there's a paradox there because all these six the only successful study and teplimzumab is probably the only one at the moment is all about pre-diabetes and so some countries there were very few there was discussion from people from Sweden uh, people from the UK are setting up screening programs potentially looking at the combination of genetic analysis, genetic risk factors, together with antibody measurements, C peptide, etc. But we're to give an example from the UK, we're a long, long way from doing this. And there was a very good debate on this in, in ISPAD as to how this will be taken up by countries, how effective it will be, effective it will be and how useful for then using immunotherapy. And the overall answer came was that people are very sceptical about, about this approach at the present time. Now, it may well change as the uh, data comes through from these countries about their pre-diabetes screening programs uh, using the combination of neonatal screening uh, information together with later screening uh, uh, through the school system, etc., but it's a long, long, long way down the road. So for the person who gets diabetes, there is, to me, sadly, a, a great uh, void at the moment of saying, well, can we actually really change the nature of the beta cell destruction at that point? And given the fact that the heterogeneity of type 1 diabetes uh, is there, that may be a fruit, much more fruitful area to go down using the different concepts of what therapy we might, might use, which is why I go back to this whole business of maybe there should be more emphasis on the, on the uh, morphology and the pathophysiology of the beta cell itself. So I'll leave it there. Um, I'm delighted to ask questions.